Good evening. You're watching Latino Talk TV. I'm your host, Jose Luis Jimenez. And I'm Ben Mendez. We are filming live here in Houston, Texas, in the beautiful, historic East End at the Houston Media Source uh, Studios. If you've ever thought about doing your own television show, this is a place to do it. I want to let you guys know that Houston Media Source is here to help you out to become your own producer. If you ever thought about it, join us. It's a lot of fun, right, Ben? That's right. It's a great opportunity for those that want to work behind the scenes as well. That's right. If you ever want to volunteer on the show, we're here for you. We'll take your free labor anytime. <laughs> Go ahead. When talking about that, hey, uh, what's going on out there? Well, let's talk about some current events. As mm -hmm. you all know, there was a massacre in Aurora, Colorado. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, there was 12 people that have died so far. There's many people still in the hospital. So that number might increase. But today, uh, James Holmes, who is the 24-year-old 24, 24 former doctoral candidate, uh, was arraigned today in court. Mm -hmm. It's going to be interesting to see what happens in his court case. Yeah, I'm, I'm really uh, interested to see what's, what's, what really occurs from here. But I've also been surprised with the media spin that's been out there. You know, whenever these types of situations occur, I, I like to pay attention to all the stories after the fact. You know, how they interview everybody else. You know, I, the way they're portrayed, it, it's, you know, it's, I don't know, I, it, it leaves me kind of perturbed. Well, I don't think he's going to be able to get a fair trial. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he, he's going to be convicted. I think he's going to get the life sentence, no question about it. But it'll be, it, who knows how long that will take because of all the court proceedings. But let's look at what, what you know, before his picture came out. Number one, why did they take so long to release his picture? Why do we have to wait till court date? You know, the only thing that was portrayed out there is that he was a doctoral student, that he was disturbed or he couldn't find a job. You know, I consider all these feel-good stories surrounding this young man. And there's going to be a lot of negativity now uh, related to going to the theater or mm -hmm. going to see the Batman movie. Uh, unfortunately, it's going to cause a lot of problems for a lot of people. Well, that, we're, we're, not, we're we react in this country. We never, we're not very proactive until something bad happens like here. So let's see what occurs. The other item that was in the news today, Penn State was fined $60 million because of the sex scandal. Wow. The molestation scandal. And, you know, there's going to be a long-term effect for Penn State. Uh, not only is it going to affect the university, but it's going to affect the economics around the university because there's going to be many people impacted. Well, the people who are really going to be impacted are going to be the students because they're the ones that's going to pay the $60 million fine. You know, they, the new, new students coming in just like they're building a brand-new stadium. It's not the ones who voted on it at that time. It's not the ones who committed the crimes of the past. It's going to be all those future generations that come in that's going to pay for that $60 million fine. I, I don't think that's the right, the right move. Well, you know, unfortunately, we're not in the boardroom to make those decisions. Uh, the, coll the collegiate level, the NCAA uh, board members are going to have to determine what's going to happen from here forward. I know they're going to use, they're going to lose a lot of scholarships to the, for the athletes that mm -hmm. are playing football. So it's definitely going to affect the football program. Yeah, but what? Why are we penalizing the future generations? It just, I just don't think that's correct. You know, it happened. It's, it's happened in the past. The person who who committed the crimes is is being punished. But why are we penalizing the university? And why are we penalizing all those future students? Well, I kind of disagree with you because uh, the leadership. There was many folks involved in the cover up, mm -hmm. uh, including the coach that passed away. And, but there's some people out there that are still walking the streets uh, that have not been convicted yet. Yeah, but who's, why are we charging the, the, the students? They're the ones going to pay the $60 million. Yeah, well, I disagree with you. Who else is uh, going to pay for it? I disagree with you. Okay, uh, there, but there, tell me why. There, Don't just tell there, me you're going to disagree. There's going to be a lot of people impacted okay. uh, with, with this decision mm -hmm. that the NCA made. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there are some people still walking the streets today that have not been convicted, and they need to be convicted. Okay. Yeah. But who's going to pay the $60 million fine? The students. It's going to be a combination. It's the people that contribute okay. to Penn State. I mean, it's, it's tax dollars. It's all kinds of in, in incentives, incentives that the college has to bring in funds. The people that bring in those funds are going to be hurt as well. So if it happened here in Houston, it would be okay? No, it would not be okay. Uh, there, there's going to be a, a lot of people affected by this whole scandal. Well, we're going to agree to disagree. That's right. All right. We always do. <laughs> Next. What do you got? Uh, there is a, a case. 14 people died in a Ford pickup accident. Uh, apparently, there were some folks that were from Guatemala that were in the back of the truck, and this truck plowed into a couple trees. Mm. 
and 14 people died thus far. There's going to probably be more, unfortunately, because there's some folks in critical condition right now. Why were they riding so many people in the same truck? Well, the story has not been out. There, there's not enough information out right now. So I imagine that there was some illegals on the truck. Now, why you got to assume that they're undocumented? Well, huh? just why you gotta call me legal sport? <laughs> just my impression from Look, I reading... rode in a van with 15 people going to El Paso just, just about my every impression. year when we were kids. Just my impression. You're you're just as prejudiced as everybody else. There you go again. Okay. <laughs> Let, let's talk about another issue that's affecting all of us. Uh huh. Uh, the economics, of, of course, mm -hmm. worldwide. Uh, we we are going to go through some serious issues uh, down the road. Uh, they're predicting that we're going to go through another recession, and mm -hmm. it's going to hit us all, not just here in the United States, but worldwide. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, as, as you all know, there are China and Brazil are kind of like the superstars of economics here in the worldwide politics and as well the economics. Mm -hmm. So it would be interesting to see how this downturn affects those two, com those two countries. Mm. Well, I think there's a simple solution to that, and it's that everyone needs to tighten up their belt, including ourselves. I think we, we live way beyond our means. I see it just about every day. We, we, we love this lifestyle that we have of having a bigger house, a bigger car, and we forget that someday we have to pay all that back. You know, the well, access to credit has just changed the way our, our economy works. You know that there are some cities that have gone bankrupt. Yeah. And a lot of it has to do with the pension system that we have. I mean, just look at our pension system here in Texas. Uh, there's a lot of folks that are suffering right now because of their pensions. Uh, right. Now, if let's just say down the road, if we cut pensions, what's that going to do for the elderly? Yeah, you're correct, but I think the real problem is not our pension system, but it's our lifestyle system. We want to we want to have everything now and not save for tomorrow. And then when something bad happens, we have a downturn or, or any kind of disability occurs, we're stuck. So speaking of that. You know, the, the topic of today is going to be about our, the economics of our health, the diabetes, and how it's impacting the Latino community. I really want to learn more about that. What do you think? Well, Texas is known for having the most people that do not have health insurance. Yeah. So it's a good topic. Uh, I'm glad we're talking about diabetes today. Me too. You ready to get started? I'm ready. All right, team. Uh, I would say team to everybody here in the, in the studio. We're going to take a quick break right now here at Houston Media Source. And we're going to come back with some very special guests, and we're going to get an in-depth conversation about diabetes and the Latino community. You're watching Latino Talk TV. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching Latino Talk TV. And now I'd like to welcome our guests. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to introduce Dr. Nina Trejo Gomez. You're the senior research scientist and faculty at the Methodist Hospital Research Institute for the Center for Diabetes and Research and Cornell University, and also a professor at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. And also, uh, Dr. Palermo, you're an optometrist at Bel Air Eye Consultants. So thank you so much for joining us, and we really want to get right into the topic. You know, what causes diabetes and what is it? Well. There's a couple of types of diabetes, type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and type 1 is not as common, uh, particularly not in, in the Hispanic community, but it comprises 1 to 5 percent of diabetes in the country and in this area, and it's more related to an inflammatory response, like an autoimmune response. In other words, all your cells that produce insulin completely are destroyed by some invasion of some pathogen, and you've got to inject insulin or pump insulin or you know, that's the only uh, form of survival. Type 2 diabetes is more related to environmental variables and genetic predisposition. And of course, we've seen how diabetes has gotten, you know, worse, uh, and it's all associated with the degree of obesity in this country. So children who used to perhaps uh, never have diabetes when they were children are now having adult type of diabetes or adult onset diabetes when they're five years old, seven years old. And we're starting to see changes to the retina in children as young as 10 years of age to 16 years of age uh, with silent hypertension in children, silent hyperglycemia, uh, uh, silent hypercholesterolemia. So type 2 diabetes is a little bit more complicated just because it involves, uh, you know, usually they don't secrete enough insulin. And if they have insulin, they, don't, they can't use insulin. 
um, there's other hormones involved that are messed up and so you end up getting all this derangement that leads to a lot of uh, changes to all the tissues including of course heart attack and strokes. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do at the university and as well as yourself? All right well part of what I do is to formulate uh, clinical studies with human subjects uh, in order to learn how to prevent diabetes and our main focus is with young Hispanic women from 18 to 35 years of age. Also, uh, we have programs in children. Of course, we also have programs for diabetes management and throughout the lifespan, you know, elderly, adult population, etc. So what we're trying to do is uh, we study the fat cell a great deal and see uh, at what rate we can actually decrease inflammation and reduce the amount of fat in the liver, uh, fat in the tissues, and actually prevent diabetes in women. Uh, Hispanic women between 18 to 35 years of age happen to have the greatest waist circumference than any other population in the country and therefore have the highest risk. So they're also the, the most difficult to get in programs because you know of the inherent socioeconomic challenges they already face. But we have a, a large number of women that attend our, our programs in Denver Harbor Clinic area, in uh, Magnolia Park, and community family centers. We have programs there and second ward by the Art Clinic and a number of uh, other areas. So there's management research and then we also do clinical practice as well. Dr. Parlerma, what so how does this relate to uh, vision and, and what you do? Yeah, you know, uh, it's important to understand that diabetes is not just one system. It affects the whole body. So anywhere that you have microvasculature, the tiny little arteries and veins that take oxygen and nutrition to your body is affected. Like she was mentioning, you know, um, your kidneys, people that have to end up on dialysis, your feet, your hands, all these other uh, parts of your body are affected severely from diabetes. My interest is obviously the eye. Um, you know, they always say that a, uh, a picture's worth a thousand words, so I'm going to go over some little slides here that kind of show us okay. what happens with uh, the diabetes Let's in the eye. There so. we go. So yeah, obviously it is the leading cause of blindness in the U.S. Uh, under the age of 65. The longer the patient has diabetes, the more likely that they're going to develop uh, what we call diabetic retinopathy. The earlier we can diagnose and treat the disease, the more likely that it's going to be successful. So if I could get the next slide, or myself. <laughs> um, the important things are blood sugar control and control of hypertension. What happens when you have high blood pressure and blood sugar, uh, high blood sugar or diabetes is that if you have leaky vessels that leak uh, proteins and lipids and blood and you're pushing them faster with high blood pressure you end up leaking a lot more it's if you had a leaky water hose and then turn it on full blast it's gonna leak a lot more uh, hyperlipidemia is the, the same thing uh, you end up leaking more lipids etc through those little veins and arteries um, and other risk factors it was elucidated to earlier is genetics so let's see the next slide let's see if we can get some pictures here Okay, the symptoms, it's important to understand that patients that come into the office oftentimes are unaware that they have diabetic retinopathy and even that they have diabetes. I diagnose diabetes a couple of times a month with patients that are completely unaware they have it just from visual disturbances and looking in the back of the eye, we can see some little hemorrhaging, etc. cetera. Uh, cataracts are also more common in patients with diabetic and they tend to change a lot quicker. Retinal findings, I think we're going to see through some of these next photos. The retina is the fine neural tissue that uh, basically makes up the inside of our eye. So, let's see. There we go. Easy enough. From right to left, you have the cornea, the nice clear tissue that covers the eyeball. Right behind that, you'll see that little hole that makes up the pupil. The lens is where the cataract takes place. But what really is... Um, has a lot of changes in diabetes is the retina or the fine layer that we see on the left hand side of your image here that nice orange tissue with all these blood vessels and arteries and veins crossing through there if we can go to the next slide it'll show you what we see when we're dilating a patient so when you take a look in the importance of a, an exam is that you actually get to visualize arteries and veins in the eye unlike any other part in your body uh, the, what you see there on the right hand side, that little yellow spot is the optic nerve. That's where all the veins and arteries stem from. That tiny little red spot right in the central portion of that image, or a little to the left perhaps, is the macula. The central five degrees of your vision is what gives you the most uh, acuity 
and that is the area that can be damaged with diabetes um, as well as any other part of the retina. But if that central portion is damaged, then you can't see. If we go to the next slide here, this again should be perfectly clear. If we remember that little picture that we saw a few uh, slides ago, instead of being clear, we see a nice opacity. That's a pretty dense cataract. So this patient probably couldn't see very well. Definitely not well enough to get around or drive or anything of that nature. Uh, the good news about cataracts is that even if you're legally blind from a dense cataract, it can be removed in about a 10 minute procedure that's done under topical anesthesia in the hospital without really any uh, real difficulty. The next slide. Oh, previous, there we go. So we saw the normal retina and that's what um, we would always like to see, but sometimes we start to see some hemorrhaging. If we look clockwise from the upper left uh, image here, you start to see some little red blots. It may not be that evident on that top left, but as you go to the right, top right, you'll see some hemorrhaging as well as what we call cotton wool spots or egg, uh, exudates that are essentially little infarcts in the retina, which is where the, um, the retina is not getting enough oxygen and nutrition, and you start to get microscopic little strokes there. Obviously, it's progressing on the bottom left. We start to see more areas of this damage. And in the bottom right, you start to get bleeding. So what happens with diabetes is when you're not getting enough nutrition and oxygen, you start to develop these new little vessels, what we call a proliferation or proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And when you get to this stage, the retina is really, really damaged. And most of the time, it can't be salvaged 100%. So you will have some permanent vision loss at that point. The next slide, I think, is... Uh, so essentially, somebody with that amount of damage, instead of seeing a nice pretty picture of two kids holding a soccer ball, would see a blurry image with all these spots. So those little strokes of the retina don't offer any more vision, so you start to get notches of your vision gone. Next slide. <clears throat> now it's important to understand that even though those are the images that we're seeing now is how bad it can get, it is also important to realize that you don't have to have any symptoms at all to have retinopathy. So it's, an, it's uh, critical to get your eyes examined and dilated at least once a year. Now, the image on the right here is what we call a fluorescent angiography. If you can see all the tiny little spots on the retina, what you're actually seeing is leaky blood vessels or aneurysms within the retina. Uh, that, you inject a dye into a vein and take some images, and you get to see exactly where the leaking takes place. On the left-hand side is another uh, machine that we would usually see if there's any damage to that central portion of the vision or the macula. As you see the top little green image, um, there are little cysts there that look like a little hill, and that would limit your central vision severely. Uh, the one on the bottom left is completely normal, so that's what you would want it to look like. Next slide, and I think we're pretty much. Is that that's it? it? Yeah, that's All it right. for the slides. I thought there was one more. <coughs> so, but, so if you don't control the glucose level, how long does it take for one to get blind? Yeah, that's an excellent question. It's impossible to say because the sugar level can vary so much. You know, now I can tell you that I have patients that have been diabetic for 20, 30 years and have zero diabetic retinopathy. And I have patients that have been diabetic for three or four years and have horrible diabetic retinopathy. So control of blood sugar is the key. And like I mentioned, I mean, I've seen children that are 16 years of age with changes right. to their retina already. And diabetes in general, uh, not just diabetic retinopathy, but as we know, there'll be no symptoms sometimes that you have high blood sugar or high blood pressure or high cholesterolemia. And I, I like the, the photographs that you brought up because they're very demonstrative of what's happening all over the body. It's a systemic disorder. So it's an inflammatory response all over the body to the heart, to the kidneys, to the lower extremities. So high blood sugar in essence causes clot formation. So the higher your blood sugar goes, the body's not able to get rid of these clots. So obviously that's obstructing blood flow to the every organ you can think of, why people lose their lower extremities, why people lose their sight and uh, primarily lose their, um, their kidney function, especially in Hispanics. That's hyperglycemia uh, is very correlated in Hispanics for these type of you know, diseases in particular. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, the ultimate would be to have a heart attack and stroke. And um, I, I think, you know, in essence, there's very simple ways to try to, you know, diminish these symptoms or hold, hold, if you already have changes to the eye, for example, or to the heart or lower extremities, you can actually stop it from progressing. We may not be able to reverse the changes, but 
they're just simple things that we can mm -hmm. that we can teach a patient to do. Well, let me let me announce the phone number. We are taking live call-ins. If you're watching the show right now and you have any questions directly for the doctors, please call in right now. The number is 281-846-5079. And uh, since there is no cure for diabetes right now, is, is there any opportunities for any transplants here in the United States or anything like that happening here? There's always been pancreatic transplantation available uh, for a number of decades, but the thing is pancreatic transplantation often is very difficult because it's, it's an organ that uh, less than 2% of the tissue is actually for what's called endocrine function like metabolism. 98% of it is for digestion, so to speak. And what happens is if you take the pancreas out and put it into the abdomen, it'll, it'll like auto digest everything. It's like an acid pretty much. So one of the best places that they've been able to attach it is uh, like close to the bladder and we can detect whether there's, it's rejecting. But the problem with with uh, pancreatic transplantation, you know, the you know most patients have type two diabetes. Their problem has never been that they can't produce insulin. They produce too much insulin, and it's been uh, hyperinsulinemia has been related to, you know, atherosclerotic plaques, or that is all that fat that might clog the arteries and obstruct uh, circulation, and that itself, the fat itself, causes inflammation and lets a lot of clot formation in itself go through and that's what causes heart attacks and strokes and the loss of all different organs. So if, you know, the, the very, there's very few people who will have, uh, will be candidates for pancreatic transplantation. There'll be people who don't produce insulin at all, which are type one patients. And those are very few and far between. Mm. So, you know, the way I look at it is we have less and less physical activity especially in the school systems. Uh, and we look at the uh, curriculum in the junior highs and the high schools. PE is not a major course anymore. Uh, what are we doing to educate our families that it's really important that we pass legislation that requires physical activity in our schools? Well, a lot of us have, have joined at different levels, you know, um, to speak in front of the House or uh, the Senate to try to explain to him how simple things are to detect issues. For example, like acanthosis nigricans, something as simple as having hyperpigmentation to the skin. Uh, we, we ask that that be part of, of uh, annual checks at the schools. Whenever they check for scoliosis, you'll see that they'll check your children for uh, a darkening of the skin. Anywhere you have like folds of the skin, it's easier to detect here. So if you have darkening on the folds of the skin, which could be anywhere in the body, but this is easier to see, then we can tell that that individual, that child or adult, for example, is not able to use their own insulin as well. And all they have to do to sensitize their body to use insulin is to move their body groups, increase fiber, increase water, because really they just can't use insulin. That's one of the issues. Once they can start using insulin, their weight comes down, cholesterol comes down, blood pressure comes down, and we can halt the disease from progressing. So, Doctor, how, how can we spot the beginning stages of this? We, we know what should parents look for in their children? You know, they're having eye problems, especially with this. Yeah, you know, um, blurred vision is the number one thing. What happens is that little lens where the cataract forms actually uses sorbitol, which is a byproduct of sugar as its nutrition source, let's say, okay? And if there is more sugar available, that lens gets thicker. When you thicken a lens, you become more nearsighted. So patients will have blurred vision, especially they'll see near but not distance, you know? And any time that kids are having those types of issues, uh, you know, it's something that you should look at pretty quickly. Um, thirst is obviously one with kids and with everybody else that's diabetic. And frequent urination at night, those are the three things that I always tell parents that, uh, may have uh, children that are diabetic. Mm -hmm. and going back to the school system, uh, I have no idea. Is it required for the students to have an eye exam? Or you just have to You're go to your office and get an yeah. exam? You're really putting me in the spot because I don't really see kids, okay. honestly. But uh, I think that the smart thing to do is to have your kids evaluated before kindergarten or first grade. I don't think it's required because they can check their vision at the school but oftentimes what will happen is the kid can squint or look with one eye and not the other, you know, and kind of circumnavigate around that little test. And they think that 
they're able to see, but in all reality, they're just cheating their way through their vision mm. exam. Well, let's talk about the adults, though, because there's a lot of adults who, who choose to ignore the fact that they may be diabetic themselves. They just do everything yeah. else but declare themselves to be diabetic. Mm -hmm. So Waste. Yeah. If you look at waist circumference, that puts you at high degree of risk, even if you don't have uh, diabetes. That's the issue that I have sometimes with, you know, someone saying, well, I, I don't have diabetes, therefore they feel that they don't have to do anything because they don't actually have a diagnosis. And <clears throat> people have to remember the way we make or come up with diagnosis is a bunch of people who have our background argue all day long, and it's about economics as to how low we can go with a number when we already knew for decades that 100 blood sugar or 101 is abnormal. But we wait till for decades, I mean, I've been practicing for over 30 years, and it's it, for a number of decades, we, had, we would wait till someone was 140 milligrams per deciliter fasting before we diagnosed. And finally, the World Health Organization, CDC, and everybody fought to lower the blood sugar to 126 as a diagnostic criteria. But in essence, anything 101 is abnormal. So if he's got 101 fasting, meaning I have, he has a need for eight hours, and I have 126, I'm diabetic, he's not. But he can suffer a heart attack and stroke just at the same rate that I can. So 101 and 126 or 256 or 356 has nothing to do with it. Every, these, it's all about the immune system. So if I've got a stronger immune system, I'm less likely to have a heart attack or stroke as fast as him if his system is weaker, even if one, with a 105. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the thing is to, we measure children's neck circumference. We look at acanthosis nigricans for risk. We look at the waist for any adult. A waist circumference in general should be 31.5 for women or less and 37 uh, for men. Anything above that puts us at greater risk. So mostly everybody's waist is not where it should be. Uh oh, <laughs> you're you're at risk. Suck it in. Suck it. <laughs> you know. So, uh, go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna. You know, I uh, in my my career field, there's this the stage is. You know, I'm not. I don't know much about diabetes other than you have it forever, and then if you're on the shot, then you're really bad. That's right. how I measure how bad you are. You're on the pill or you're on the shot. Right. You know, and then I've also had some close friends and family who've lost, you know, I guess circulation and pieces of their body start drying up and falling off. It's just, I mean, what are some of the, the severities of the, of the situation? And is it possible to not be on the shot anymore eventually, or is there like some kind of pump system that can be put in place? Well, type, uh, people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes, you know, we put them on insulin pumps, mm -hmm. whether children, adults, elderly, doesn't matter whether pregnant or not pregnant. So um, those are really good candidates. But people with type 1 diabetes who don't produce insulin, you know, that's the best thing to do because the pancreas will produce insulin when you eat and stop producing it when you're not eating and only produce just a little bit of, to maintain metabolism, they're out, right? So when, but you can mimic the same thing with injection. You can give, now we have rapid acting insulins with tiny little, you know, uh, needles that mimic what the pancreas does or mimic what a, a pump does. Pumps will cost you five, six thousand dollars, but it's usually covered by insurance, so that's not an issue. Uh, in general, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, all, you know, these patients end up qualifying. But in short, you know, uh, if people with type 2 diabetes who produce insulin, if they're put on a pump often, it's because they're secreting a lot less insulin than they need, although they're still secreting, but they have liver dysfunction and kidney dysfunction. So we can't give them any pills because if we give them pills, well, they'll complete, I mean, they'll go into like liver failure completely and death. So sometimes people that are making a little bit of insulin usually are very overweight. And there's still some people who put on, insu on, on insulin pumps. But for the most part, like type 2 diabetes, uh, it doesn't, what we really like to do with type 2 diabetes now is saturate them with insulin, even if they have type 2 diabetes at the beginning, to rest their pancreas and then weed them off as we change their lifestyle or give them medication, right? Especially because we don't know how their liver is and their kidney is or how their, their other organs are. So you don't want to give them these pills that could be toxic. The other thing is that if, if you put them on, on um, these, these medications, like even insulin, these insulin can't do its job all on its own. So uh, there's other hormones that type 2 diabetic patients do not produce, and that's what really causes an issue. 
So there's a, there's a new hormone called bidurian, which um, uh, they have to mix it, but it's a once a week injection. It just came out. And what you do is uh, you mix the powder with the fluid, obviously shake it up and inject it in your abdomen. It's a, it's a hormone that's naturally produced in the L cells of the intestine. And this is what helps us when we don't have diabetes. It helps us to feel full after we eat, of course. And it, it lowers the blood sugar after we eat and uh, it shuts off, you know, it slows the emptying of the stomach and, and a, no a number of other things. But there's a hormone that, that continues to tell the liver to break down sugar and it kind of stops that. It's a mess. So diabetes really is, um, glucagon is over secreted hmm. and this shuts it down. Now, the reason this is good and people like it because it's a once a week shot, no dosage adjustments at all for someone who's overweight. So if you're overweight with type 2 diabetes and you can't stop eating and you're overweight, that's the deal. It's a really good deal because it cuts down on weight and blood sugar after you eat. The reason we have heart attack and strokes and changes to the tissues, it's post-meal hyperglycemia or blood sugar after we eat. So we gotta find mm. something to cut the edge off and the reason why it's so hard is because we don't produce these hormones with type 2 diabetes. So that's what we're replacing them with. Wow. I'm just curious, uh, w you know, we all try to eat healthy uh, as we get older. Uh, what are the, some of the things that we can do as adults uh, in, as far as our health and as far as the eating that we, we consume a lot of tortillas, uh, well, I do anyway. I can tell. Uh, frijoles, arroz. <laughs> uh, what is it that we can do as our culture, you know, we're, we're so geared to eating those type of foods. What can we do differently? Okay, Don't eat so many. Well, well, I mean, can I, what more do you want? Just like, it's, we're, 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 okay, I'll be nice. Almost everybody in the country has seen, you know, has uh, seen this plate. I mean, there's hardly no one who hasn't seen mm -hmm. this plate. But uh, just to make it short and brief, if, if mm. at all possible, uh, <laughs> people with diabetes or anybody, in order to maintain weight, if you can keep your carbohydrates to one to four per meal, one to four per meal, and make sure that those carbohydrates have fiber, then you'll do a lot better with weight management and blood glucose, blood pressure, cholesterol, and so forth. So a fruit or two a day, if you're overweight or you have high cholesterol, you have diabetes, you can eat maybe, okay? If your blood sugar is very high, you might have to hold up on even the fruit, but no juice or anything like that. Milk is a carbohydrate, even if you take all the fat out. So one or two cups of milk or yogurt, uh, might work mm. if your blood sugar isn't really high and you're trying to control your, 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 your weight's okay and your cholesterol's all right. But normally if your blood sugar's high, we sometimes hold the fruit and the milk for that meal, but it just depends on the individual, if it's a child or not a child, etc. cetera. So uh, fruit's a carbohydrate, bread is a carbohydrate, milk's a carbohydrate. So here you have one, two, three uh, carbohydrates. So that would be good. I've got half a plate of vegetables and I want to cook the vegetables kind of crispy and then I have low fat meat like fish or salmon or tuna or uh, turkey, for example, or chicken. And then I'll have water at least half the weight of, of or, or water ha in ounces half, half of my weight. So mm -hmm. if I'm 200 pounds, I should drink 100 ounces of water, which would be like, you know, a glass or two right before each meal. Mm -hmm. uh, so it just drink water, eat your vegetables or salad, and then eat your meat. And if you're still hungry, then you consider the carbs. Wow. But carbs, the best carbs in the world, especially for Hispanics, and we'll, we love it, is beans. You know, beans is a fantastic uh, carbohydrate. So, okay. I had to eat more beans. <laughs> well, all in measure. You can have this much beans or one wow. to four per meal. So we'll talk more later. Well, thank you all so much. Any closing remarks? I, I mean, I think it's, you know, critical uh, if you're diabetic to have your eyes dilated. Um, I know no, no one that I've met thus far likes to have their eyes dilated, but it's the most important thing for us to take a good look inside the retina. So even without symptoms, you can have diabetes in the eye or diabetic retinopathy, as we like to refer to it. So that would be my uh, closing statement. Just make sure that you have that done if you're diabetic. Thank you, doctor. And is there a website that they can go to to get more information with uh, your website? My website would be Bel Air Eye Consultants. Okay, BelairEyeConsultants.com. And for more information regarding diabetes in, in your eyes. And, and any closing remarks? Well, make sure everybody checks their teeth twice a year, right? Because that causes cardiovascular disease if teeth are messed up. 
um, of course, as, as you mentioned, I, they might have to have a, a echocardiogram, 12 lead EKG once a year, be followed by a cardiologist perhaps, see a podiatrist or have, check their feet at least every day and when they go see a physician. Uh, there's also estimated glomerular filtration rate, that is the, the way that they estimate if their kidneys are filtering right. So basically, just look at every organ function, you know, <laughs> eye, teeth, you know, the kidneys, mm -hmm. uh, the lower extremities, all that's going to be really important, and of course the heart. Any website you'd like to direct to? Uh, the Texas, uh, uh, the Methodist Hospital Research Institute, the Diabetes and Obesity the Subdivision, we have a, uh, a website there to get more information. Okay. We'll post those websites up in a little bit, and uh, right now we're going to get into the, the second half of the show, which is actually getting healthy and learning to live with diabetes and what's going on out there by the community to help those that are, that are living with diabetes. You're watching Latino Talk TV. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're still watching Latino Talk TV. Thank you for still staying with us on this live, beautiful East End East of Media Source Day. Historical day. Historical day. All right, let's get back to the topics. Okay, we have with us today Miss Elizabeth Sion. Uh, you're the manager with the Tour de Cure for the American Diabetes Association. Yes. Thank you for joining us. Also, Ms. Lisa McChristian. Is that correct? Yes. McChristian. And also, Fernando Lopez, you're a certified personal trainer, and you work specifically a lot with uh, diabetes. Uh, I have. I have worked. Uh, it's hard to get away from uh, uh, obesity and the effects of obesity, so I definitely have a, a lot of experience with uh, type 2 and prediabetes. Okay. Uh, more so than type well, 1. Well, you're walking right into the question, man. So, so what can we... Okay, now we just learned all the details, all the technicals. So what do we do to avoid it? You know, because I think that's what we have to learn. And then once we're there, how do well, we get out of I've it? I've been told that you need to stay away from tortillas. Well, I mean, you are, you're not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> the whole wheat one's maybe a little bit better. Uh, <laughs> no, yeah, I mean... It's like I drinking no duels. Lifestyle, <laughs> lifestyle changes, basic lifestyle changes uh, make a big difference. Um, Finding time to exercise is probably the biggest obstacle. Um, and then making the sort of adjustments adjustments that come with the active lifestyle, eating um, the sort of foods that are, are, are more like fuel uh, to the system instead of something that weighs you, weighs you down and, and uh, it takes away from the performance of the body. Uh, so I think the biggest obstacle in, in my eyes, especially within the Latino community, is um, uh, familiarizing and being educated on the uh, aspects of edge of uh, uh, physical fitness and what it does to the human body and and why you should do it so that there's a level of appreciation that I don't think is really there uh, in my experience with the with Latinos is uh, um, it's not it's not where it needs to be in my opinion you know what I find amazing is that you go to the store and you see hundreds of pills on save I guess uh, losing weight or all kinds of diets and things that supposedly work in 30 days. Right. Now, we all know that's not true. But the reality is, how can we lose weight healthy, health, being healthy at the same time? Slow and steady. Slow and steady is always the key. The problem with um, exercise programs, and it's not the problem with the exercise program, more with the exerciser, is that um, nowadays we're in a society of instant gratification. and um, putting forward a goal that uh, may be six months or a year away just doesn't seem as doable for a person who's starting off, um, you know, from being a couch potato and overweight to wanting to be that fit person that they imagine themselves to be. So I think the biggest thing is, is, uh, um, is making sure that you're patient with the progress, mm -hmm. that you know that it, um, what you're trying to accomplish um, doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen in 30 days. Um, and sometimes it takes over a year. Um, but it's the process, process that you should be focused, and, uh, focused on and not so much uh, the end result. And if you do that, then you'll usually uh, achieve those goals. Wow. Lisa, tell me about uh, the efforts that the American Diabetes Association is doing to help the community. And also, tell me about the Tour de Cure. Um, well, the American Diabetes Association is doing quite a bit um, here, right here in the Houston community. Um, what's really great about the ADA is that uh, the funds raised through events like the Tour de Cure and some of the other um, fundraising events that we have actually get funneled back into the Houston community. So we're spending over uh, $1 million here in the Medical Center for Research. 
um, trying to find a cure for both type 1 and type 2 diabetes, as well as trying to research better medications for our, um, people living with diabetes. Um, we also do a lot of outreach programs, um, programs like our camps for kids, kids living with diabetes, and primarily we focus our camps on those living with type 1 diabetes. But for those kids, it's the first time that they're going to be around other people living with diabetes. They don't have to feel like they're the only one. Um, and a lot of times it's the first time they give themselves their own insulin injection or learn how to t uh, test their glucose themselves. Um, and we provide full med staff for them as well, so the parents get a first time to feel comfortable about where their kids are going, but then they get to just be a regular kid. Um, we have our Project Power, which is our African American initiative. We're working with the churches um, to get the word out about diabetes, and it's um, a lot of the communities uh, we're finding is that people don't want to know about diabetes, they don't want to get tested because they feel like if I don't know that I have diabetes, then it's not really happening. And um, what we've heard earlier is that that's when your body is doing the most damage. Um, and what we found is working with the pastors, people are a little more willing to get screened, get the information, hear about the warning signs and trying to make a difference in the congregations. Mm -hmm. um, we also have our Feria program where we do um, free immunizations for kids, glucose screenings, vision, cholesterol, blood pressure. Um, uh, for all the participants, we typically see about 4,000 that will come through that day. It's a one-day event um, happening, I believe, in the middle of October. Um, so it'll be a great opportunity for those who may not get an opportunity to see a doctor to be able to get the screenings that they need to find out they have diabetes, and then as well get the resources to know where to go once they've been diagnosed. Um, so it's a, a great program that we have. Um, and then we also do advocacy. We actually just represented somebody not that long ago in the Sugar Land community. I was a firefighter, and when they found out that he was living with type 1 diabetes, he was fired. Um, and so uh, ADA actually um, funded his representation so that his rights would be protected, and then as well as the rights of our kids that are in school. Wow. That's amazing. He would get fired because he has diabetes? Yes. I've yes. never heard of such a thing. There's and so how did it, what happened as a result of that? Did they go to court? Yes, it went he to court and he back, won. Or? Didn't get his job back, okay. but um, he did go to court and, it, and he did win. So um, I think it's one of those things where, you know, people need to know who they can go to uh, when they're uh, being discriminated against. And it happens in our schools as well. And um, we have a school walk program that works with our uh, nurses and our PE teachers um, and even educating our kids to be sensitive to those that are living with diabetes. I imagine you all do a lot of stuff with the Texas legislators. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming that you educate them about what's going on and the effect that they're having, their policies are having on our kids. Mm -hmm. uh, do you all go to the Capitol and fight for the rights of the kids? We do. Um, uh, I know that we have a whole advocacy group, um, and you can actually go through diabetes.org to sign up a part, to be a part of the advocacy group um, to continue to fight for diabetics' rights, to fight for more dollars for research. Um, and then there's also a way that you can participate um, through the web. So you can actually sign petitions uh, virtually, so you can get an email, and if it's something that you feel that you agree with and it's something that you believe in, you can sign it electronically. So there's great ways to get involved with our advocacy. You know, I was listening on, I listened in on you guys when you were talking about the physical education and the importance of childhood um, physical activity. And I think it needs to start in the home, more so in the mm -hmm. schools. Um, in the schools, unfortunately, you may or may not have a good physical education teacher. They may just roll the ball out and say, go play. And that's not really physical activity. That's just, you know, uh, filling up an hour. So I think it needs to start off from the, from the house with our parents saying, hey, listen, you need to work out. Yeah. Let's go go to the park together, spend time with the kid. So that as they grow older, they learn to appreciate exercise. Mm -hmm. And that's where it starts. It starts from the family, not so much in the school. So if you had, you're talking to parents here, so what should we do? They're watching on TV. What is it that they should do? Because a lot of parents have the excuse of, well, I work 10, 12 hours a day, and I got to get home and cook dinner, bathe the kids, da, 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 and you're telling me to go work out? Why should I? Because it's important <clears throat> for their health, and it's an important for, it's an important thing for the health of their child. Yeah. Um, at some point, the priority has to be where it needs to be. Um, I understand there's socioeconomic situations and that, that come into play, but ultimately you are responsible for the... Uh, well-being of your child and and also for the sort of principles and ideas that they're going to value as an adult mm -hmm. so if you don't set that example for them in some way whether it's yourself doing it or having um, um, 
a close relative, someone that you can trust that, that can be that can be that mentor. Um, if you don't have that in the beginning stages, it's never going to be set. And one of the things that I find a lot with clients that I've that I've worked with um, is that either they had really bad experiences as a kid in physical education where they were made to say run a lap because it was a form of punishment, um, and so they associate it with punishment, or they were never introduced to it at all, and so. And when they become an adult, it becomes such a chore, something so foreign to them that it almost seems impossible. So it needs to start as a young age, at a young age, and, 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 and it honestly needs to start with the parents because if you don't value it and if you're overweight, then, then it's going to affect how that kid perceives uh, obesity and, and, and how they perceive themselves. Yeah, speaking about working out, tell us about this tour de cure. So we have, um, this is going on our fourth year, so Tour de Cure is scheduled uh, for Saturday, September 22nd in uh, Champion Nissan and Katy. Um, we have, it's basically a cycling event that benefits the American Diabetes Association. So our focus is our Red Riders, um, cyclists who live with diabetes. Um, and so it's five different routes. Uh, there's a 10, fa uh, 10 mile family route, uh, 27, uh, 47 to 63 and 100. Um, and we welcome everybody. It's, it's a fun ride. It's not a race. Like I said, it, it generally uh, focuses on all our red riders, but everyone is welcomed. Um, our 10 mile family ride, you were talking about how we can encourage our kids to get out there and get active. We have a lot of kids out there that are on their training wheels that do the 10 mile ride. So um, we also welcome uh, volunteers. We have an awesome rider village, which basically uh, we have a band. We have some entertainment there. We have um, Oh, f great food. Texas Beef Council is out there for us. Um, and we have fun activities for the kids. And as if you want to wait, if you don't want to cycle, you're more than welcome to sit out there, hold up signs, and wait for the family and everybody else who participated in the Tour de Cure. I'm sure that you've come across many kids that have gone through diabetes uh, with their families. Uh, can you remember any specific stories that you can share that really touched you? Um, I would say... Gosh, we've got one of our, um, our actual tie sponsor for the event is uh, Dignity Memorial. And there is a gentleman whose son was diagnosed um, very young and um, he, he remembers taking him to the hospital and almost losing him and being told that his son has type 1 diabetes, that there's no cure, he's never going to get better, and this is what it's going to be for the rest of his life. Both parents worked. They couldn't find any daycare that would take him because nobody wanted to have that responsibility of giving their child injections. The parents didn't know if the wife was going to have to quit their job. They didn't know what it was going to mean for them financially. They didn't know what it was going to mean for him in terms of his life expectancy, what he would, would go through. But the training wheel story is Bradford. He is five years old. He is living with type 1 diabetes, and he did that 10-mile route on his bike with training wheels. And if you can say you don't think that you can do this ride, you have to think about Bradford doing it with type 1 diabetes, doing it with training wheels, doing it when he's five years old. Mm -hmm. And if he can do it, you can do it. Wow. Yeah, those kind of stories, I, I think, catch, capture our viewers' attention. Uh, so do you have any more like that? <laughs> We've got lots. <laughs> I mean, you know, Liz has been with the ADA for 12 years. I've been with the ADA for seven. Y you can't not fall in love with all your participants. Their stories become your stories. They're the reason why we come into the office every day. You know, I've got an almost two-year-old. She's got two little ones. Um, and it never meant so much until we became a parent because you just, mm -hmm. you want to do everything that you can for them. And whenever my child is sick, I think about, the parents who have to give their kids insulin injections several times a day. They have to check their blood sugar several times a day. So it, it's just, you you hear so many different stories and you get so passionate and it's why we come to work so that we can make a difference in the fight against diabetes. We hope that it's called a tour to cured someday so that someday we're writing because we found this great, great cure for those living with diabetes. Um, but every time we go into a company, an organization, or we speak about tour, I've never gone in there where 98% of the people didn't know that they were, somebody living with diabetes didn't have a personal story of themselves. And what we always say for the 2% that didn't raise their hand, it's you do know somebody, you just didn't, didn't realize it because there's somebody that you've been working alongside of for 15 years living with diabetes that wasn't talking about it. So it's, it's really something that affects everybody. And talking about 
how the family needs to make a difference. The current statistic now is one in three children born after the year 2000 are going to get diabetes in their lifetime, and that number goes to one in two for minorities. So when you say, I don't know if I have time to exercise, I know we all live busy lives. We're both working parents. Everybody has hectic schedules. You have to make time for your children to live. You have to make time for yourself to live so that you can be there to watch your kids grow up so that you can see their grandkids. It's the first generation that isn't going to outlive their parents. You know, we have to do something about it. It's urgent. So speaking of new generations, I want to congratulate Mr. Ben Mendez here on his uh, new addition to the family. Yeah, I had a little one on Friday, actually. Congratulations. Congratulations. I'm you. surprised you're awake. What's <laughs> his name? Introduce him to the world. I had to uh, take some pills so I could stay awake all day. <laughs> <laughs> so no dose. You're right. No. Uh, but actually, uh, I had a seven pound, five ounce baby boy. Your wife had him. Well, that's right. <laughs> okay, my, my wife. <laughs> yeah, but I was there. You, you but, caught him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it, it was a great experience uh, seeing a natural birth. It's uh, something you won't forget, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wonder what she's going to say after this. <laughs> yeah, but uh, for all of those of you having children soon, uh, I highly recommend that you're there for the birth because it's an awesome sight. Mm -hmm. And when all these stories you're telling me, and it's, I have two little ones myself, and you know, I, I get into the path of being lazy as a, as a parent and working all the time, and I'm just sitting here replaying all those moments that I've had that I could have gotten up. So it's like, today's a new day, so let's move forward here, right? You know, we were supposed to have a, a weight loss competition at the beginning of the season, yeah, and we uh, forgot to do it. Yeah, we're going the opposite. We're having a weight gain competition right now, so, <laughs> so we're we going to turn back. it around. We need to invite you back so you <laughs> can give us some training here. You guys need to do the tour to cure on September yeah. 22nd. Get on some bikes. I, I think okay. it's important that we, we get more people engaged. All right, I'll do it. More, more people involved in the process so they understand diabetes because right. I, for one, don't understand diabetes. I'll be the first to admit it. And so it's good to have this educational piece. Then let's ride, the, let's ride it. I don't mind doing it. <laughs> Not electric bikes either. I don't mind doing it. I, I have my, my little bike. All right. We're on. You can use any bike. I've seen <laughs> yeah. hybrid, unicycle, tandem, you know, whatever, road bike. And if you don't ride a bike, um, we've also timed, uh, I've uh, teamed up with uh, the ADA with uh, my studio, my indoor cycle, and we're spin uh, studio, and we'll do a, we're doing a lot of fundraising with ADA, as well as catering to people who are maybe not bike riders, okay. um, and would like to contribute to the cause, okay. and we can do that as well. So we have that close partnership with the ADA and, and, and providing that service for people who may not, may not have a bike. So where can they reach you if they want to help with the fundraising or any more information about diabetic workout programs? Where can they reach you? What's well, your American Diabetes Association's website is an excellent website for all kinds of sources, uh, resources in terms of educational tools and, and, and tips. Uh, MyIndoorCycle.com is um, where we'll be doing the spin classes um, and, and fundraising for the, for the organization as well as uh, at the uh, event itself we'll have okay. um, the spin bikes there. So if you have an interest and just don't have a bike, that's also, also an option for you to ride and raise money for the organization. Awesome. That reminds me, NHPO, the National Hispanic Professional Organization, uh, their running group is starting. Uh, they train every year for the marathon in January. Mm -hmm. uh, it started this Saturday. Actually, it was supposed to start with them. Uh, unfortunately, I had other things to do this Saturday, but uh, excuses. for those of you, <laughs> excuses, excuses. Uh, for those of you interested in being part of a running group, mm -hmm. uh, even for those that have never run a marathon in their life, they can do half marathon. Uh, and they can start training. This actually started again Saturday, but they will be meeting again this Saturday okay. at 7 a.m. Memorial Park. All right, so closing remarks. And what would you like to say to the parents out there watching? Well, for the parents out there watching, I'm a parent. Like uh, Lisa mentioned, I have a three-year-old and a seven-year-old. Um, there's really no excuses for you not to get out there and exercise. I ride my back with my family. I encourage you guys to get out there and be active um, and come support a tour to cure at September 22nd at Champion Nissan and Katy. All right. Okay. Quickly, I you got less than a minute. Go. I just say make today the first day to, to do something different. Get involved with the tour, uh, diabetes.org slash tour. Um, get out and get active, get healthy, and make a difference in your health. All right. um, as a Latino, I hope that uh, all Latinos take this to heart and uh, uh, become the role model for their kids. Be fit yourself, and then your kids will be fit too, and you'll start a trend. Awesome. So get active, get out there. Let's do something to stop the spread of diabetes. 
and uh, let's just protect our families, okay? You are watching Latino Talk TV. Thank you for much, so much for joining us tonight. Have a great night. Thank you.